Oh, Greg Lynn. So, we have definitely need to thank Greg Lynn for the use of his wonderful gallery. Thank you, Greg. And now I'd like to interview Marilyn Mattingly, who I have come to love dearly over at least a couple of days. Infrequent but very serious comments. Not to cast any aspersions. 
But I think, Dan, according to my calculations, it's Greg Kendrick who should be speaking next, right? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm a retired professor from UCLA, and I pride myself actually in having every lecture I've ever delivered has been still called or it and presented. But when I was when I was thinking about David, I found myself writing <laughs> a lot of stuff. Now, this will go quick, but I'm going to read it to you. I'm going to read it to you, doctor. Okay, I'm going to read it to you with sufficient miracle compromise. Okay, so it's not to put you to sleep. All right. In the fall of 1971, I was making my way down from the fourth floor of Boyd Hall, one of the more decrepit dormitories at the University of Kentucky, uh, to get something to eat at the cafeteria in the adjoining women's dormitory next door. As I approached the first floor, I heard this deep, stentorian voice coming from what passed for Boyd Hall's living room. Oh, please. <laughs> I heard in that exasperated tone of voice. I would come to know all too well. <laughs> Richard Nixon never had a plan for peace. It's been four years and we're still in Vietnam. The man's not only a liar, he's a war criminal. Yes. <laughs> seeing seeing as I too shared this sentiment, I decided dinner could wait. I simply had to meet this fellow who was voicing such an impeccably correct judgment of the 37th president of the United States. Though to be honest, I take this hands down. So, in any case, that's when I first laid eyes on David James Manning. And I have to tell you, he was not at all what I was expecting to be. Most of the people I knew, including myself, who shared anti war views at this time, tended to sport long hair, some kind of military jacket, usually the deck with a peace symbol or an upside down American flag, blue jean bells, and fry boots. This was the de rigueur uniform of a student activist in the early 80s. The fellow standing in the Boyd Hall living room castigating the president was tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, had a swimmer's bill, and was dressed passably well. His hair while longish was well groomed. Hell, this was someone who could have passed for a fraternity president. <laughs> in fact, I could hear my late mother whispering in my ear, why can't you be more like this guy? <laughs> in any case, I looked straight at him and I said, I couldn't agree with you. I don't understand why the Democrats don't impeach the son of a bitch. It was not really increasing. Anyway, that comment was greeted by that distinctive Manningly laugh, and it signaled the beginning of what would be a long and beautiful friendship. Over the course of that evening, I learned that David's family lived around the corner from my grandparents off Old Goldsmith Lane in Louisville, and that they were also members of St. Pius the Temple Parish. Uh, aside from having been raised in devout Catholic families that had been in Kentucky for you say the better part of 200 years. Yeah, that's all we do in Kentucky. We breathe and we get on. <laughs> I also found out that David and I were staunch Democrats, shared passion for politics of the left wing variety, uh, enjoyed poetry, though my taste ran inside of the thing with the beats, and wanted to see the world. Uh, now, this is ironic. I was going to be a lawyer, and he was planning on being an academic, studying and teaching. As matters turned out, I ended up the professor of history, and he ended up the high-powered, very successful lawyer he was. Okay. Now, over the next two years, David and I were neighbors on Aylesford Place, which, for those of you who don't know, Lexington is the heart of the student ghetto at the University of Kentucky. Uh, this was a time when my apartments served as a gathering spot for discussions that went on long into the night about everything from the new Pink Floyd album to the impeachment crisis in D.C. And through all of these conversations, there was David, okay, making pronouncements, does this sound familiar, about the writings of Edmund Husserl and Herbert Marcuse, urging all of us to read his beloved Helena Rand, right? Now, it's a testament to David's persuasive powers that I actually did read Helena Rand's The Human Condition. Now, I can't say I understood a word of it. <laughs> I certainly don't remember any of it except a phrase called the Vita Optima, the act of life. But um, I read it, I just felt I had to make that effort because 
David thought it was worthwhile. Now this happened a lot, by the way. And if I ever hear another word about Saul Bell, it will be too soon. <laughs> but I digress. Um, and David, of course, was always arguing in favor of reformation or revolution. You know? Now, for those of you who don't know, part of our circle was one of the members of the six members of the Young Socialist Alliance on the University of Kentucky campus. And those guys argue about everything. I mean, these guys would argue for hours about whether there was a revolution in Cuba. Anyway. <laughs> now, now, when David went to Washington, D.C. to enter, enter and later worked for Congressman Ron as only Louisville, I would visit him from time to time and sleep on his couch. As all of us here know, David could be quite short. Right? And I was always struck during these visits by the fact that he had ingratiated himself with every staff of the right? bill. I was also surprised when he would take the liberty of marching me into the offices of various representatives I admire. Ron Dellums, Bella Abzig, Shirley Chisholm, Barbara Jordan. You'll be surprised by this guy, Barry Goldwater Jr. <laughs> and he would introduce them to me. He would actually introduce them to me. Now, for a kid from Jefferson Town, Kentucky, population 500, this was pretty heavy stuff. Now, because he knew I was a big admirer of Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, he surprised me one day by taking me to a greasy spoon near the court where Douglas ate lunch. <laughs> and in typical Mattingly style, he marched up to the justice's table with me in tow and told him that the two of us were among his biggest fans. Yeah. Now, I was mortified. I was three days old. <laughs> Douglas was apparently delighted, and he invited us to have cheeseburgers and beer. That was, and still remains, one of the high points of my life, and he even made it possible. Now, I'm going on about these early college experiences with David because they set the pattern for our friendship over the next four years. Uh, we both moved out to San Francisco in 1976. In fact, David and the guy who was involved with the time, John Deputy, stayed with me while they looked for an apartment which some of you may remember uh, over on 14th and San Jose. Uh, looking out over this group, I remember meeting a lot of you for the first time at that apartment over dinner's drinks and a lot of really fun parties. Uh, that's where I first met Joe Bell before he opted to move to Grass Valley. Okay, the irascible Scott Rosen. Uh, Tom Nolan before he ran and actually won a position on the San Mateo City Council. Author Fenton Johnson, who unfortunately couldn't be with us here tonight. And a community organizer named Harvey Milgram, who later became the first openly gay elected official in the U.S. As he did at the University of Kentucky, David made a point of always surrounding himself with interesting people from many backgrounds and all walks of life. And no less than he did at my apartment, so I know for place, he expected a lot from his friends. Indeed, as all of you know, whether you're one on one with David or in a social setting, you were expected to talk about everything. <laughs> The latest politics, books, movies, art, poetry, food, wine, sexual escapades. Nothing was off limits. And you were expected to spar with him intellectually, an exercise that could be positively infuriating and exhausting at times. In fact, Meryl and I were laughing that, that whenever David would go home to visit his family, they would send out the notice that it was time to gird the loins. <laughs> <laughs> David was going to be in <laughs> Now, I make that last remark lovingly. As all of you know, David was a big man with voracious appetites and a balanced love of life. He also did not suffer fools easily. And he always spoke his mind, even if he knew what he said might get under your skin. Hell, especially if he knew <laughs> it would get under your skin. Which brings me to what I love the most about him and the miss sword. David was what the English call a friend that makes you better. It's an old English saying, may you have friends. May you bless the friends that make you better. Much of who I am today is because of it. It pushed me in college to think more deeply and read more widely. I was pretty lonely and shy when I got to the University of Kentucky. <clears throat> David brought me out of my show. He also helped me step out of the closet when I was 24, which was not an easy thing for a Kentucky Catholic who had been raised to think of homosexuality as a pathology. When he went back to law school, it inspired me to take the leap to graduate school and PhD. <coughs> His love of art inspired me to become a collector as well. His enthusiasm for my two published histories, which are dedicated to him, by the way, kept my nose to the grindstone and his ruthless editing of my manuscripts made it so much better for me. My editor said my books were the easiest they had ever edited, and I told him it was because they were first edited by a lawyer with a fine grasp of prose. In 
in short, I think I speak for all of us here in saying that our lives are so much better for having had David in I want to close on a somewhat political note because, well, David A. for a slum of politics his whole life. The last time I saw him, which was the second weekend in October, Scott Rich, we're in Palm Springs at that time as well. We were having some wine and talking about the unthinkable. How would we survive? a Donald Trump presidency. <laughs> I thought about it for a minute, and I remembered a quote from one of our favorite writers, the anarchist educator and community planner, Paul Goodman. Many of you may remember growing up absurd in America. I went online, found it, and I read it to him as follows. I have learned to have very modest goals for society and myself. Things like clean air, green grass, children with bright eyes, not being pushed around, Useful work that suits one's abilities, plain, tasty food, and occasional satisfying cooking. <laughs> <laughs> David laughed long and deep at that point. I'm going to sorely miss that laugh in the days ahead, as I'm sure we Thank you, you went very well for your life, Tom Bailey. It was a good way to go. The next in line is longevity would be Stephen Saul. Stephen, you here? If you took a look at the youngest picture of the but that's what he looked like when I met him. I was a young congressional lady, having just met my lover of 23 years, and I knew people in his office, in Ramona was on his office, and I remember first eyes on him as a young intern who had just arrived from the conference. Yes. Uh, there's so much I could say, which in like company I won't say. <laughs> uh, I think David, uh, uh, back in those days when David was with John the Deputy, we didn't have a lot of money. And for, for, for labor, for Memorial Day, it was cold in Virginia. So we would actually drive down to Virginia Beach and camp out and that's when we met Marilyn. That was quite a long time ago. Early 1974, and we worked on the same floor in the Longworth House office building. And we'd hang out at Perry Pittman, the late Perry Pittman's um, apartment, and talk about the revolution. <laughs> and to put the times in context, because many of you will remember your own reference to these times, in 1972, when I moved to Washington, homosexuality was still a mental illness but most of us had done well in life, we were part of the largest cohort of, of, of gay men, especially to arrive in Washington. And we decided individually, collectively, although we hardly knew what was happening to us individually, much, much less the world, to persevere and to go on and pursue our careers. And what careers we all have, and all of you are testimony. Um, David and I have had our ups and downs. I've, I've, I've always held my own. <laughs> my, my partner used to get irritated because he didn't realize I wanted to do what David wanted to do. <laughs> but uh, we had some incredible times, lots of Christmases, New Year's, Christmas and New Year's with Scott, uh, Christmas in, the, in, in Buenos Aires, and our famous trip to Rio where I met my current partner of of now 16 years, which I never thought would ever happen, and it did happen. Um, we've had, he, in many ways, David, for me, was my intellectual alter ego. Um, we had a lot of history, having started the same place, uh, having known all of his partners throughout his life, uh, having been friends with them, most of them, um, and, um, and, and, and good, wonderful history. David was very good to me in many, many ways. So here's the thought I want to leave with you. David had the capacity that my own mother had for each of her three children. For each of us, we were her special one. Okay? We had our special relationship. We were honored. We were cherished. And it really didn't matter that she loved others because she loved us dearly. And I, can, I believe I can say with confidence, and it doesn't matter what my relationship was or wasn't, it does matter what your relationship was with David Matthews. 
and it was a special one and a dear one. And you'll carry that to your grave. And you'll always be with fondness and love. I will never forget standing on Copacabana Beach, December 31st, 1999, with Ron Harmon, who's sitting here, and everybody, one million people, dressed in white. And we were there, and it would have been predicted. Suddenly, there was a downpour. Do you know what happens to clothes when they get wet and they're white? That's all I'll leave, uh, I'll leave you to reminisce or think about what that might have been. It was Feeling a, no pain. <laughs> it, it was a really special, of course we were up all night that night. Thank you, Steve, for uh, that reminiscence. Next in line, we're moving right here to Ground Zero, San Francisco. Joe Grubb, who was on our working committee to put this together, he did all of the tech stuff, got this mic, and helped us uh, arrange to do that. And he knew David in some special ways, too. So, Joe, are you out there? Hey, Joe. Yeah. Hey, that's it. Yeah, I heard it. <laughs> I have my teleprompter here so that, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, I don't go off message, and you know, Southerners speak rather slow, so I want to make sure that we all get out of here by midnight. Um, there was no mistaking David James maddeningly when he was in the room or even in the building. <laughs> I mean, the man was an incredible warrior spirit who, as we know, was larger than life, and oh my God. When he started expounding on a topic, fasten your seatbelt. Uh, you were just going to sit there and throng and see where this all was going. I often felt like I was on a jury listening uh, to an attorney pleading something. And you knew you'd have to vote his way, otherwise it was going to be hell. And as everyone said, the man had an amazing capacity uh, of knowledge and also an amazing capacity to expound on it ad infinitum. And um, <laughs> you all know what I mean. I especially uh, enjoyed his uh, conversations when he'd get with someone either talking about politics or uh, uh, yeah, mostly politics or legal issues. And, uh, oh my God, despite his disability, when he got going, those arms were a-flailing. <laughs> and he was like a bull in the china shop. And um, he had an exceptional ability to get people's goat. <laughs> As we all know, we did not take any prisoners. And uh, I would just say, he was a bit headstrong. Okay, that was an understatement. I'm sorry, Carol. Uh, it was something that served him well, and sometimes not so well. Uh, and, you know, he could have had a career in theater, uh, drama, I'm sure. <laughs> but I think uh, he, he did find his love in uh, law. Yeah, and his life. And, and, already heard from the others speaking here. And it was like a, he was a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. And I don't know if anyone got to see the whole puzzle. I know I didn't. Uh, but I know I love I'm gonna cry. I love the humorous, intelligent, thoughtful man that he was. I'm gonna miss those uh, hours of conversation over bottles of wine and other substances. Yeah. I'm like, something new. But I'll tell you what, that I'm always going to be grateful for uh, having crossed paths with the spirit that was heading inside. Thank you. Uh, following 
uh, uh, Joe. I, it's my actually great pleasure to introduce to those of you who don't know him already, Scott Brown, my fellow member of the bar uh, in Nevada County, California. And uh, we have a history, <laughs> mostly good. And uh, it, it involves Paul, uh, who's here tonight, as well as David. I'm going to give the mic over to Scott Brown. Hi, my name is Scott Brown. I'm an attorney, been an attorney for practicing for 40 years now. And I've known David for most of that time. I'd like to start out with the joke that David uh, told me a while ago, because I thought it was kind of revealing. It's a joke about this uh, lady who came from a, a less than polished background, and her husband, who was a social climber, wanted her to improve herself. So uh, he had sent her to charm school. So one day she goes to uh, uh, the doctor's office, and she's waiting quite a while, and there's this lady sitting next to her with a big fur coat and obviously very uh, full of herself. And she turns to the uh, lady and says, uh, well, how are you? And the lady says, well, I'm fine. I won't, I'm so lucky. You see this big diamond ring? My husband got that for me because he thinks I'm just so wonderful and lovely. And, and so she turned to her and said, isn't that special? <laughs> so then she says, and you know what else? My husband got me this big mink coat you see that I have on. And so she says, isn't that special? And he, of course, said it with this wonderful Kentucky accent. And then finally she says, and he also got me that Cadillac that's sitting outside the doctor's office. And she says, well, isn't that special? And so the lady turns to her and says, has your husband got you anything? And she says, why, yes. My husband sent me to charm school because he loves me so much. She says, charm school? Why? What did you learn there? I learned to say, isn't that special? Instead of, fuck you. <laughs> and this is the kind of, this reminds me so much of David. Because he had all that southern charm, but he could also say, fuck you. And, uh, and there was this edge to David. And uh, uh, so, and you had to, he was a person uh, of many parts. He had great virtues, but also great flaws, and we all are unfortunately aware of those. <laughs> um, and, but he was a person who we all remember, and I got to know, I knew him both as a friend and in his professional capacity. And as an attorney, he was a remarkable trial attorney. He had that ability of strategic thinking and to present issues to a jury in a way that was con so convincing. He won some remarkable cases, to the point where uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, experienced Superior Court judges here in San Francisco County, where he had a trial, came to him after the trial, after he'd won, and said, young man, that is one of the best presentations and trying of a case I have ever seen. And I think that speaks a lot of David, that he was both a brilliant mind, but he could see through things and convince people of things. And so he was... Even if they weren't true. Wow. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. He, he, was, he was very good at, at, at being persuasive, and yet he had the biggest heart in the world. You know, it... Uh, he was generous. He was generous. And, well, just looking around this room, the people... I mean, I've gotten to know so many of you. All of you are incredible people. And th that reflects on David and the kind of person that David was. Is he has all these incredibly talented, thoughtful, vivacious, fun, humorous people around him. And that is his greatest gift to me, was getting to know all of you. So thank you. I appreciate uh, the opportunity. So uh, we're down to the last of the talking heads, and uh, before I introduce him, I just want to say 
I had this amazing experience over the holidays. No, I find it. Uh, I was privileged, had the opportunity, and took it to go to Louisville for the first time. Pronounced correctly. Thank you very much. I actually practiced earlier this afternoon, and I actually was given lessons by Susan Maryland's. You need a little more up. Uh, oh, yeah. Low. 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 <laughs> anyway, uh, it was just an amazing thing for me. I was like a foreign dignitary from another planet appearing at the Mattingly Memorial Service in Louisville. And, uh, you know, I got these, the, the first thing that I knew, of course, were wearing name tags because they all did it. And I thought it really spurs communications to have a name tag on it. And I've noticed it really worked here tonight, which is very sweet and wonderful for me. But uh, I was in this crowd of people. I knew uh, Susan Maryland's older sister, David's, the oldest in the Manningly family. And uh, I had met his, uh, some very limited contact with his other family members and siblings. And the vast majority in the crowd was about this big or slightly bigger. I didn't know at all. And I repeatedly got this, oh, you're the Joe Bell that we've heard about. Oh, you're Joe Bell. David said, and I, I'm going like, it's not true. It's not true. Whatever. <laughs> discount, discount whatever it was. But the bottom line is very sweet and heartwarming to be there and share that moment with the family. And we have here tonight uh, David's cousin, Tommy, uh, who moved to Palm Springs serendipitously uh, and was able to, and I'll never forget when David called me up and said, I know you were expecting that I, that you were going to be my executor and blah, blah, blah. I've changed my mind. Uh, Tommy, my cousin, has moved here, and I'm designating him as my executor. And I said, David, that's the wisest thing you've ever done, or one of the wiser things you've done. <laughs> so I want to, I want to welcome Tommy Burnett, please. something I, I presented in the service of the Louisville that was appropriate for here as well. And um, well, first of all, thank you all for coming here tonight to celebrate the life of David James Grant. This is exactly what he wanted. Not a mournful, sad world service, but a celebration of his life. A life and what a life he had, as you've heard tonight. When David asked me to help handle his medical and financial affairs several months ago, I told him I was honored. Did it hesitate? Of course, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but especially comes to family, how could anyone say no? And as it happens with family, as we grow older, we tend to drift apart, always keeping in touch in some way, but loving our lives as our families wanted us to. For the last couple of years, especially in the last few months, I could spend a lot of time, I mean a lot of time, with him, for which I'm grateful. It gave us a chance to reconnect, to reminisce about growing up together, but also to learn more about each other's lives by the time we drifted apart. Talking about them growing up, we talked about visiting each other's homes as kids. His family, a small three bedroom house on Meadow Drive with five children, one bathroom. Us, my parents, my sister Jan, along with my grandmother Nana, sharing the first floor of the triplex on Everett Avenue in Louisville. We would go to the management homes sometimes for overnight stays, other times for family meals on holidays, such as Thanksgiving or Christmas. Now, those meals, the meals where the conversation was dominated by whoever could talk the loudest. <laughs> and usually it's a contest between David and Marilyn, sometimes Mark, the time Susan and Michael pipe in. But our family would just sit back and watch. Not daring to get debate about politics or religion. No way. It seemed like David was the loudest because he was passionate about what he believed. And that passion obviously served him, served him well in his entire life. During her last visit with David shortly before he passed, my sister Jan talked about the times he was come over to our house and 
in our basement, we have this big, huge, cavernous basement. Like, if you ever saw Home Alone, the big furnace, that kind of basement, very scary. Um, and we had a play area where, of all things, we had what we play at school. She reminded him, uh, when she was about 10 years old, David was about 12, how he absolutely tortured her with the word he made her learn. A word that stuck in her mind all these years. Anti disestablishment areas. <laughs> it's a real word, Google it. It's a real word. What, first of all, what 12 year old would even know the word? What it meant, much less try to teach it to a ten, his 10 year old cousin. But that was David. He was always challenging his mind and others. But after the time, he was, uh, after his time working in Washington, D.C. for a congressman from Mazzoli, David headed to California, to San Francisco to begin a new chapter in his life. He was deeply involved in politics in the Bay Area and decided to pursue another passion with his, which is why. He also had a thirst, a passion for travel. <clears throat> David, along with his many friends and family, traveled the world. His curiosity of, of others led him through all kinds of countries, through Europe, Russia, Africa, India, Japan, South America, many other places. You know, ask, ask Joe. You know, his best friend in more than 40 years, about some places they've been. And some of the hair raising fights <laughs> with David driving. Speaking of driving, as a passenger in David, has anyone ever ridden with him? Well, Back in 1999, my husband David and I came out to visit San Francisco and met David for dinner. Afterwards, he drove us up the hill above the Castro District to his apartment in the city. It was raining, it was long, very winding roads, sharp turns, narrow, dark. It was, it was a white mountain ride. As David sped up the road, ignoring the rain, making his turns maybe 50, 60 miles an hour, who knows. Enough to where we wondered we're going to tip over and fly off the road. But thankfully, we made it up, and we made it back down. David was very generous, especially to those who were loyal to him. <coughs> but he's also generous to others whom he did not, didn't know. He believed in helping those who did not always help themselves, including his clients. One example that was witnessed over the summer, there was a, a bug problem in David's apartment. So, the apartment manager had pest control company come out and send someone out to spray and grow the bugs. When this guy showed up, David, he talked a little bit. David told the guy about his situation with cancer, and the guy started telling him about his own father, who had just recently passed through cancer. So he understood what David was going through. As the guy finished spraying, David called me, called me to his bedroom and handed me $20. And he had me $20. Now most of us not think of doing something like that, that's just how David Something else too that Marilyn just mentioned as well is towards the end there he was still very aware of what was going on. And a couple of days before he passed, he called Marilyn over and myself and he said to Marilyn, I want to do something for the girls who can care of me. What do you think we should do? And we came up with the idea of gift cards. So the next day I went out to Coles and bought gift cards for every person who helped take care of it. And Marilyn passed them out to them as they came and saw them for us and that's the last time. That's, again, that he was thinking of others at a time that he was, you know, trying to think about for himself. That's how he was. Um, he was also very particular about how he expected things to be done. Wouldn't you agree, Marilyn? I mean, over the last several months, yeah, exactly. Over the past several months, David introduced me to many of his closest friends, some of you here tonight, who I've never met. And now we've become friends, including Joel Bell, I call him his brother from another mother. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a fortunate situation and unfortunate circumstances that my cousin, my husband, and I, eventually my sister, would all end up living in the Coachella Valley of Southern California. And even more coincidental, the day and night was barely a mile from each other. All the faith, coincidence, and destiny, but I was glad to be there for you. Shortly after his diagnosis, David told me, I've lived a great life. I've done a lot of things that most people don't get to do. I have no regrets. And that's the lesson he taught me to control this. 
Live your life like it's your last day with no regrets. Thank you, David, for being my cousin, my teacher, and my friend. Thanks, uh, in the bubble bath with bubbles blowing out of the tent at Shamwari Game Reserve in South Africa. David almost killed me driving the Patagonia. The skid marks are in a picture there. It could go on and on. Memories we all have will not forget. I want to say this in closing. I'm a child, a boomer, child of the 60s. I was here in San Francisco for the revolutions of the 70s. I uh, gained and understood my career as a lawyer after I left San Francisco in the 80s. And I'm so happy, happy to have had all those times and to have the time since. And it reminds me, and I forgive me, Scott, and others who may have heard this before, I'm going to say it. It was a very special author in a very special set of books and a certain poem that lives on in my mind day to day, and particularly today. That was Roman Hess, uh, who wrote many books in the 70s that I have come to treasure. One of them, the Glass Bead Game or Magic for the Movie, was his master book. In the back of that, he had some poems, one of them called Stages. These are a few lines from the poem Stages by Herman Hess. As every flower fades and all youth just departs, so life at every stage blossoms and may not live forever. Be ready, heart, for parting, for leave taking. Be ready to find new light that old ties cannot give. In all beginnings, there is a magic force for guarding us and helping us to live. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.